Good morning viewers, it's like a bit after 7 o'clock on a lovely Saturday and today the Runcible gets used for what it was mainly designed for. It's designed for having fun, but it's mainly designed to be a tender for our little yacht which we lovingly call the Spacey. So, I best get rowing. Well there you go and welcome to the internet. That was the beginning of the Blowfish's first weekend away. Um, and mostly it went pretty well, but more on that later. Uh, the first sale of the Blowfish was actually in May 2022, as it says in my notes here. Um, and I released the first video of this project in 2021. Um, and I probably should have looked at when the last video was put out, but that was a long time ago. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's bad because I feel lazy and slack and I should have done something sooner. It's good because Blowfish has done a bunch of boating, boaty type stuff uh, since then, and it hasn't dissolved. In fact, it's had all sorts of things happen to it, and it's still very much a functioning little boat. So um, I'm not, I'm sort of sorry that it's taken so long to put another video out, uh, but also not sorry. Um, in this video, I was going to talk about building the rudder, the centerboard. Uh, yachts need a, like a vertical fin under them so that when you're fighting the wind, as in trying to go back against it, the boat just doesn't go sideways through the water. The sails uh, push a force that is not straightforward. It's off to the side and forward. And if you cancel out the off to the side bit, you get left with the forward bit. And that way a yacht can sail back towards the wind. Can't sail straight into it. Has to be an angle. So you've got a zigzag called tacking um, to get there, but without a centerboard or a flat surface under the boat to cancel that sideways bit, um, you're not gonna get anywhere. The boat will just go sideways. Um, I was going to talk about how I did all that and I'll be really brief and, and I'll explain why at the end of the video, but basically, um, all of this was gluing bits of timber together and shaping them. Uh, the timber I used to make the spars, that is the mast and the yard. And if you were going to make this a gaff rigger, a boom and a gaff probably as well, was just the shittiest pine you buy at your local hardware store full of knots. Um, when wood has no knots and things in it, it's called clear wood. And there was absolutely nothing clear about this. Um, basically, I ripped it on my table saw, um, spun the ends around so that what was the top is now glued to the bottom of the other piece and clamped it to something straight. I had a bit of steel um, here, but you could use anything. Um, I covered the straight thing with some plastic so that the glue that oozed out wouldn't you know, stick everything together. Um, and basically that is how I made the, the spars for the boat. The mast, um, I did a test where I hung 25 kilos off the very tip of it. Um, and I clamped it to my trailer and it flexed, uh, but it hung in there. And since then the boat has actually sailed in, um, some reasonably stiff breezes. Um, and there's been no problems. However, the mast did fall down once. And it fell down on a day where there was nearly no wind. We were like just drifting around and suddenly there was a cracking sound and plop, everything was in the water, which wasn't a problem because we like have, you know, paddles in the boat. So we just gathered everything back in, paddled to the shore and looked slightly embarrassed. And I think what happened there was I made the mast socket into the step a little bit too neat. And so it was quite a warm day um, and it had been sailing the day before or the week before um, and I think the mast had some moisture in it so it expanded and it just popped the mast step off the boat. So I re-plumbed the mast step to put it back together again just using you know, spirit levels and things, uh, glued it back onto the, bulk, the front bulkhead and then I wrapped some fiberglass around it so I think it's probably pretty impregnable now. Um, but as I've said earlier on in the video series I tend to just put things together and see if they break rather than over engineer and find myself left wondering if I've like used too much, so to speak. So that was failure number one. We'll get to failure number two. 
Um, but in the process of going sailing, um, I should point out the boat, I made a cradle, I've made two cradles. The first cradle held the boat and that was good. But the handles didn't stick out the ends long enough um, so that you could pick it up and carry it, which is like a schoolboy error, really. I should have thought of that. Um, so I made a second cradle with longer handles, which means I can just stand at one end, pick it up and drag it along. The cradle's made out of crappy wood, so it doesn't matter if it gets dragged over bitumen or grass or footpaths or whatever. And because the handles are long, I can put the end of the cradle up on the back of my ute on the rack, uh, walk around the other end, pick it up and push it on. So it, I could easily get the boat on and off the vehicle by myself. Um, it only weighs 30, 30 kilograms. The cradle probably weighs 10 by itself. Um, so the boat is not, not heavy. It's like, it's come out light. And that leads me on to the next subject about using MDF to build a boat. A lot of people will say to you, Oh, you know, other than the fact that it's like, doesn't like water and it will just turn into a sponge and swell up and fall apart. Um, it's too heavy. And it's, and they're right, it's not light. But the offset to that is you need a lot less fiberglass to cover it. And um, you don't have to use very thick MDF to build a boat. This boat's only built out of three millimeter MDF, um, which I think is, is an eighth of an inch if you talk bananas. Um, and that's not very, very thick at all. That's pretty much the thinnest MDF you can buy at a hardware shop reasonably. I'm sure they make thinner stuff. They just, you'd have to get it off a specialist merchant of some sort. Um, but the thing about the three mil MDF is it allows you to get the bends and the curves and the darts and things that, that you need to build a little boat like this. If you went up to say six millimeter MDF, which would be the next size, uh, it would be too stiff. And yes, it would be twice as heavy. So when we talk about uh, the 30 kilos that's in the boat, um, I think probably 20 of that would be uh, timber and MDF and 10 of that would be fiberglass resin, filler and fiberglass cloth. Um, maybe a little bit less and a bit more on the wood side, but n not a lot. Um, so MDF being very tough, being flexible, really offsets the fact that it's really too heavy to build boats out of. In fact, this project has been so successful as far as just it works that it's made me wonder about building a bigger boat out of MDF, um, like a five and a half meter sports boat, for instance, because a performance boat built out of MDF, that would be hilarious. Um, I don't know if you could make it work because the loadings are a lot higher uh, when you've got like a high powered rig and you're like wanting to push something along at close to 20 knots, um, especially when you have like a two meter keel with a bulb on it to like make it stand up in a stiff breeze. It's probably not going to happen, but the thought is there. Anyway, I actually did a bunch of testing in video four about the strengths and uh, puncture resistance and all that sort of stuff of MDF as a core material and why it's good. So go back to video four uh, and have a look. I think it's video four. Um, and have a look if you're curious. There's some graphs and stuff like that. And I also look at um, how long water ingress takes if there's like the, the fiberglass coating is actually damaged and water can get in. And I was surprised it actually, um, like it, it didn't penetrate very far. I left a piece of MDF with uh, in a tray of water that was coated in fiberglass but the end was raw um, in a tray of water for three days and the water didn't go very far up the wood um, which really surprised me I thought it would behave like a sponge uh, but no it doesn't the other thing I was going to talk about in this video is the finish I used and while I varnished the deck and the front bulkhead um, because they're plywood um, everywhere else where I've used timber, I have just used furniture oil, garden furniture oil that you can buy at your local hardware. Um, you sand the boat back to with 110, 120 grit paper or round about 100 mark. Um, and that leaves the grain a little bit open, which allows oil a chance to get in. Um, and the next day you come back and you oil it again and you rub that oil in with like some 240 grit paper. Um, and you end up with a really nice, very smooth finish that looks a bit like a satin varnish. And the reason I like oil is when it's damaged, and after all, this sort of, 
And the reason I like oil is when it's damaged and the sort of boat this is, is going to get knocked around and bumped. Um, and we'll get to that. Um, varnish, once you chip it and water gets into it, creates a real problem to repair. Whereas oil, you give it a rub with some sandpaper, put some more oil on that bit and rub it back again and then give it a buff with a rag and it's done. It's like super duper cool way of, like when I make furniture and stuff, like the board gaming table we made for this household, um, we oiled that and if it gets a scratch on it, you just sand the scratch out and re-oil it and give it a buff. If that was like lacquered or varnished or had a, like a two pack on it, um, repairing that scratch would be a lot of work. Uh, the next thing I'm going to mention is the sail. I went for a lug sail because it doesn't have a boom and part of the rules for the boat is that no bit is meant to be longer than 2.4 meters or eight bananas roughly. Um, and so that includes the mast. So. If you're going to make a sailboat, the mast needs to be a reasonable length to get your sail up into the breeze. Uh, and so you're going to need a two-piece mast in layman's term. And that leaves us with a gaff rig or a lug rig and possibly some others, but I didn't consider them. Um, and I watch, uh, I watch a guy on YouTube called Roger Barnes who lives in France and has a boat that looks like it's about just under five meters long, four, four and a half to five meters long with this lug sail. He goes camping in it, has a tent that he lives in. It's got like a little kitchen inside it. Um, it has like a battery power inside there where he can run a GPS and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the guy has a ball with his cruising friends in France and he has a lug sail on this boat. Um, and I was like, you know, I want to try one of that. I had an old sail laying around here, which I chopped up uh, to get a lug sail out of. Um, and I, when I made the, the yard, uh, the, the top spar, um, I put a slot in it that you could slide a, um, a bolt rope into, which is a rope sewed along the edge of a sail, so it will slide into a track. Um, and um, worked really well, worked really well. Um, a lug sail does not like going into the wind very much, but it will do it. It's nowhere near as good as like a, a standard Bermudan rig or a cat rig. Um, at least I don't, the one I've made isn't, um, but it works. It works well enough to satisfy me and reaching across the wind, they're great. It goes like a, like a demon. Um, so when we take the boat out, if I need to go out wind at all, I always just have the oars with me, which are spoons because the boat's called the Runcible. And dropping the sail and just starting rowing is really easy. There's no boom down the center line of the boat that needs to be removed so you can sit on the seat and row. Just let the sail down, put it to one side of yourself and off you go. Really simple, super easy. When the mast fell down, it was like so easy, just like picking things out of the water, putting it in the boat, rowing ashore, <laughs> going, oh, oh golly, that was no good. Anyway, so with a lug sail, I sheet it like what, uh, with to the corners of the transom, um, just with two sheets. Uh, if you're sailing with two people in the boat, really the person skippering has to do everything. You know, the old, the old, you know, um, the old trope of one person doing the main sheet and one person steering the boat just doesn't work. You get tangled up with each other. In fact, the boat sails really nicely by itself. Um, you can put a second person in it; it suddenly becomes really crowded. However, if you're rowing it, three people, no dramas. Two people sitting on the seat, one, each one with an oar, and one person sitting on the, the transom seat, uh, the back of the boat, uh, and it trims really nicely, sits in the water really well. Uh, we did this a couple of times when we were away for the weekend. We basically took the boat to Rotnest. Uh, the Yacht Club does a race to Rotnest every year, and we towed it across even though we were racing and still didn't do too badly. So the boat actually tows really well as well. Um, the only problem with towing, and this is another issue, was when you go too fast, our boat goes upwind at about four and a half to five knots. Uh, but when it reaches on a breezy day, and we came back in 20 knots of sea breeze, um, it does close to eight. And at eight knots, the little green boat, it gets a little fountain in the middle where the center case is. And after about an hour, it got enough water in it that it, it found it and tipped over and we had to rescue it. Um, which was annoying, um, but it was more annoying that it happened just as we were coming in the mouth of the harbour 
uh, in Fremantle here. And so that's a really crowded bit of water where people are going out for the weekend and coming back. And there are we with this little green turtle upside down being towed along behind us. But I put a boat hook under the gunnel, gave it a hook, it righted itself. It, like even though it was full of water, once it had stopped, it was still stable. I got in it, it was still stable enough for me to, to balance in it and bailed out the water. And then we got going again. Yeah. All I need to do is make a little plug to put in the top of the center case so that when you're going faster than about five knots, you don't get water spurting up and filling the boat up. Um, I guess you learn. Uh, the other thing that broke was while we were at Rotnest uh, and I was rowing, um, I came up to our yacht to get on board and I accidentally got the handle of the oar jammed under the gunnel of the boat as I came alongside and that popped the roller holder off the side. I hadn't glued it on properly. And that's a down to me error. I should have prepped the surface better. When it popped off, I could see I hadn't sanded the fiberglass where the block of wood that held the roller holder was. Um, and I'm still in the process of repairing that because I'm lazy. The boat has been living outside in the weather without its cover on because I've been repairing this bit of gunnel uh, for about three months now in the rain. I've, it's filled up with water two or three times and I've emptied it um, as a bit of a test and I've given it a poke around. No part of it has gone soft. Uh, so it, it's like stands up to the weather really well. Um, so one of the things I've done, uh, which I spent most of the last month doing in patches, is I've written, let's call this a document. Uh, it's about 16,000 words with a bunch of pictures and diagrams of how to build the blowfish. Um, this is a document I will make free for people to download or if you feel like you'd want to like pleasure me with some of your coin um you can go to the party meeple website and there's a buy the book button where you can give me 10 bucks or 20 or whatever you can pretend you buy it six times and i'll get 60 dollars out of you um if you think that reading the book about how i built this little boat would be useful um you know it'd be nice i, I would appreciate the support um or you could just buy one of the party meeple games or other things there um, all of this would be great. Um, I'm also developing a little print and play sailing game, which I talked about in the first video. And the first two iterations of that were pretty shit. We like, I made a prototype, we faffed around with it a few times and there were things in it that just, it, either it was just boring or it didn't work or it got locked up. When you're designing game mechanisms, often you will do something and someone will do something with your something which will cause something to make nothing happen. Um, and I think the first one was one of those. The second iteration, uh, the choices that you got when you were choosing your something were just boring-ish, I think. There wasn't like enough of them. Uh, but the third choice, the third choice, we've played that a few times. Um, I need to do a little bit of tweaking, um, but that works. And I really like that. That boat, that blah, 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 blah. That game will be called Wake, and it's about sailing a boat upwind. When you're racing a yacht, for those people who haven't done any yacht racing, um, most of your race is upwind because you have to sail, as we talked earlier, in a zigzag to get up to the top of the race course where towards the origin of the wind. Um, and that takes a lot longer than coming back when the wind's behind you. So if you spend an hour racing a yacht, you can expect 45 minutes of that to be going towards the wind and maybe 15 or 20 minutes coming back with the wind. So your biggest gains in a yacht race are made going into the wind. And this game models that part of the race. You're basically on the start line and you're trying to get to the first mark, which is what we call the windward mark of a race. Um, and I will do a video about that in the next few weeks on the Party Meeple channel where I do most of my board gaming stuff. So if you're curious about um, a yacht racing game, that's a place to go and subscribe so when you, you'll know when it comes out and have a look. Um, I'm actually really pleased with how it's turned out. Originally the game was going to be a model of the Vendee around the world race, you know, that you could race around the world in a 60 foot um, high performance maxi. Um, and yeah, I just I couldn't make it work the way I wanted. I had a bunch of ideas and none of them really panned out or fitted the model well. Um, and when I scaled the whole thing back to like just boats racing upwind in your local river, estuary, inshore, inshore series, um, I got something that worked quite well. If you're a sailor and you're curious about this, 
go and subscribe to the Party Meeple channel so you know when um, I've posted a video because it won't be far away. Um, and it'll be something that you can print out on your computer at home um, and, and play it for free. Like all my print and play games are, they don't cost you anything other than a bit of time and some printing ink. Um, and in fact, there'll probably be a giveaway. I will probably make a couple of copies um, when I do that video and people who answer a question about sailing or you know, tell me what my favorite color is or whatever, um, I'll post them a freebie of my print and play game, which will be called Wake. Anyway, um, if you've uh, just come to uh, the Blowfish Build video series, then welcome. Um, and if you're curious about how it was done, there's eight other videos back that way uh, where I do a very rough and reasonably rapid, this is how you build a boat out of MDF and fiberglass. Um, if you've been here since video number one, well, thank you for sticking with me and thank you for being patient enough to, um, you know, wait for this final video to come out. I have a loose plan that's probably, you know, six months to a year away where I get in the blowfish and I sail down the Swan River, like spend an entire day in it, um, and do like a little potted history of the estuary, which we call a river, um, around Perth, between Perth and Fremantle, um, with a little adventure video series, let's call it. Um, if you've met, if you've read um, Messing About in Earnest, or um, The Voyage of Jack de Crow, I think that's what it's called. Um, people going on big adventures in small boats. Well, my my adventure won't be any near near as big as either of those. But if you're curious about some of the history of the Perth Swan River settlement and region, then maybe I'll do a little video from the aspect of a 2.4 meter pea green boat with spoon oars called Runcible. If you haven't subscribed, please consider it and thanks very much for watching.